I'm going to add this on to the recording I finished a few seconds ago about Andrew Luster. You're about to hear it. I want to tell you this. Uh, I don't know how many years ago it was. 15 years ago, I think. Discovery Crime, Criminal Discovery. It's a TV channel. I called and asked if I would come on and talk about the case because I had written about it extensively. I said I would. I went down to New Orleans, filmed it. It appeared on TV a couple of weeks later or something. And there I was, and I'm not going to say they, they clipped and moved around my words. They did not do that. But what they did was they edited what I said and then plopped it into the middle of two arguments that said Luster is as guilty as the day is long. And I was very specific in saying the opposite. He got railroaded, he's innocent, and he should be released. But when you bookshelf what I said and and move it around a little bit, it looks like that isn't what I was saying at all. So I think that's just, and that's why I'm presenting this to you here today. Also, to be clear on things, Andrew Luster, before all that happened, uh, read what I had written uh, before going on television. He read what I had written, and he was very angry at me because he said my his lawyer had provided me with inside information that was privileged, and, and I'm a horrible person. Um, I, I don't, I, that's not true. I, I, there's no inside privileged information here. I don't think any lawyer in his right mind is going to give me that stuff because uh, he could be disbarred. And I wouldn't know if it was privileged anyway. Besides that, the, the, uh, the facts that I have and that you're hearing uh, audibly and that I wrote down in the story can all be found in newspapers and magazines and that sort of thing. So I don't think it's fair for Mr. Luster to be so angry at me. Again, I wish him all the luck in the world. Mr. Luster, the terrible. guy this story is about, was just denied parole uh, earlier this week. So I guess since I spent so much time on this, I went on a TV show, Discovery Crime Network, Crime something or other, and they did a special about this guy. Um their take on him and my take are two different things. I think this is a guy that doesn't belong in jail. He was used. He was set up. Um, and it's just a tragedy that he's still in prison. I, I don't understand it. So the name of this is the Andrew Luster case, Sex, Lies, and Injustice. Let me tell you something. They were all scum. They all worked together to bilk a millionaire, Andrew Luster, the heir to the Max Factor fortune. But the money-hungry women were the worst in an abominable group of humanity that included greedy and immoral lawyers, slimy private eyes, DAs with high political ambitions who were willing to sell this guy down the river for it, prosecutorial zeal had gone mad, predatory law enforcement, bounty hunters with stars in their eyes, and a one-sided judge. I mean, it's that bad. Think about it. If you had had all that against you, what, what would you have done? Would you have held up? I don't know. You'd have to be one tough son of a gun to hold up against all that. They all had a motive in building a rock-solid criminal case against Luster and sending him away to prison for a long time. The longer he was sent away, the more they would profit. Some would get rich from putting him in jail. Others became famous, and some would see their careers skyrocket, actually. They would not have gotten away with it. In fact, the entire ugly mess that took apart Luster's life probably would have never happened had the media not taken on this herd mentality to hurry injustice along. Really, this is the media's fault what happened to this guy. Um, I'm not a person who believes, well, you're, uh, what happened outside of me is responsible. I'm responsible for my own actions. Uh, but that is, and we all are. But that is not the case here. The saliciousness of the crime that led reporters to take on this blame assertion that Luster was guilty, uh, the self-proclaimed guardians of trust, the media, were determined to not accurately report the true facts of the case. They were absolutely determined to do that. It was an electronic lynching. Here, let me explain to you what's going on. In the summer of 2003, the nightly news was spilling over with this thing called the Millionaire Date Rape Trial. So the entertainer, Geraldo Rivera, and he's an entertainer, he's not a reporter. He attended the proceedings and reported daily for Fox News 
and CBS 48 Hours followed the case, and they still got their facts wrong. They're, in, they're sitting in the case, and they got the facts wrong. The courtroom was always packed, and the docket and the transcripts were requested so many times that they had to bring in two clerks to meet the demands because they've got to provide this stuff to the outlets. The known facts, different from the true facts in the case, were the kind the TV media loved. Sex filled with scandalous, uh, and according to the media, simple facts. The way they reported Andrew Luster, a 30-something-year-old beach bum playboy, and the heir to the Max Fazekar Cosmetics fortune, uh, had cruised college bars in Santa Barbara, California, honed in on COVID, nameless, because she was a victim of the sexual assault, so they said, spiked her drink with GHB, a date rape drug. She passed out. He carried her to his oceanfront mansion and filmed himself raping her. That's what they said happened. Furthest thing from the truth. The girl had come forward and accused the psychon of wealth and privilege. According to the Ventura County Prosecutor's Office, her act of courage had spurred two other women to come forward with accusations as well. And, added the prosecutor, at least 10 other women were also willing to come forward with even more charges. In fact, the county had such a strong case against Luster that it filed 87 felony charges against him. On the outset of the trial, it was wrongly reported that Luster's fortune was being used to hire this dream team of lawyers who would ex hammer the prosecution. But the hammer never got that far because in the midst of the trial, Andrew Luster, held under house arrest and acting on his lawyer's advice, slipped off his ankle arm, by, let me say that again, acting on his lawyer's advice, and fled across the border to Mexico. He was declared a fugitive from justice by the trial judge, who also decided that Luster should be tried in absentia. Tried when you're, when you're not there, in other words, if you don't know. And so it was. The jury found uh, Luster guilty of 87 of the 87 charges against him, deadlocking on the final charge of felony poisoning. He was sentenced to a total of 124 years in prison and fined $1 million. Under the very public umbrella of high drama, the media watched as Luster was hunted down in Puerto Vallada, Mexico, and captured by bounty hunter Dwayne Dog Chapman. A two-man TV crew working for Chapman caught the entire event and film. The end of the story, or so it seemed. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. Hold on. Here's the story. Lester's Road to Ruin started on the night of July 13, 2000. That night, he and the alleged victim number one, Jane Doe number one, uh, how she went, went out on the town in Santa Barbara's Bar Line Island Vista section. She was 21 years old. Luster was 33. That night, the party of five included Luster, Jane Doe, and her boyfriend, uh, a second man referred to only as David by the court, and a third man called Associated Friend during the trial. It was actually her friend, but they tried to make it sound as though this was Luster's pal. Luster didn't have that many close friends. The media, CBS News as an example, reported that Luster had met Jane Doe for the first time that night. But the true fact was that like the other two women who would later emerge in this case as victims, Jane Doe, number one, had an ongoing sexual relationship with Luster and had admitted to that that they slept together, and this is her words, a couple of hundred times at least, before that night, before the night she said she was raped. Like the others, she also said she lived on and off at Luster's house on the beach. By the way, if you're, let me clear this up now. This beach house, I, I saw it. I drove out there. It, it ain't a beach house, as you and I would think. It's, it's a shack held together with, you know, it, it, believe me, it, it's a shack. I wouldn't live there, even if it's on a damn beach. So at one point, she moved in for six months, the victim, uh, who said she was raped, worked as an actor in soft porn films that Luster made every now and then, borrowed money from him, shared narcotics with him, including liquid uh, ecstasy, and was aware that he was a trust fund baby uh, who didn't hold a regular job to get by. All three women had, in fact, been paid to act in soft porn films for Luster's company, Deep Six Films. 
I'm getting ahead of myself, but let me explain what I mean by soft porn. There was no a porn flick like you and I would think with, with the nudity and the blah, blah, blah. And these were films. There's people in the world who get turned on by different crap. I don't I don't understand it myself, but uh, one crazy fantasy is they knock the girl out and then take advantage of her. I mean, it's criminal, but you shouldn't do that. But, you know, men and women have that fantasy, and they would pay him for these videos, you know, that he would make. So that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about the straight-on porn stuff. By 9 p.m. on the night in question, Jane Doe was drunk. She had been in a loud fight with her boyfriend on the dance floor. He left. He didn't want to be around her anymore. She was out of control. The remaining party moved to another night spot where they refused entrance because Jane Doe was too drunk to stand up on her own. So the group piled into Luster's aged SUV. This guy had an old car because he's barely making a living on what this trust fund paid him. It was a, not a great deal of money. And they headed out for his modest home in this tiny seaside village of Muscle Shoals. Muscle Shoals is a moderate income area, or it was then. Uh, I haven't been back in 20 years, but it hugged the Pacific shoreline. Just off of Route 1 near the L.A. County line. Um, anyway, according to testimony during the 15-minute drive, Jane Doe prefer, performed... First oral sex on David, the friend, in the backseat of the car, and then she had intercourse uh, with him. David told the court she lifted her dress and straddled me. When they arrived at the house, she stripped naked and went for a plunge in the ocean, after which she dressed and had sex in the yard with, quote, the associated friend, whoever the hell he was, and then found her way into the house and joined Luster in the shower and had sex with him there. Lab test on the dress so showed she sh uh, rather I'm sorry she wore showed traces of semen from three different men. After the shower, she sat on the living room floor, half naked and posed with a broad smile for a group photo. Then she and Luster retired to his room and, as he had done many times before, switched on the camera, gave her a drink of mixed liquid ecstasy, uh, GHB, uh, gamma hydroxide acid. Well, anyway. They both later agreed that they had told her uh, what was in the drink before she drank it. She and Luster then had sex a second time on his bed and a third time in the morning. Then she had sex with the associated friend again and was driven home by Luster in the latter part of the morning. Everyone agreed that those are the facts. Three days later, Joan One decided she had been raped, and she filed a criminal complaint against Luster, and only Luster, that he had drug-induced raped her. In the first version of her story, she told the police that Luster had slipped her this GHB pill into a drink at the bar in Santa Barbara. The problem with that story was that GHB would take effect, that is, knock someone out within 15 minutes or so. Uh, but the tale, she later rearranged it to fit the time schedule. She, she was never knocked out. She was out on the dance floor having a knockdown drag-out fight with her boyfriend, she went to the other bar where she got mouthy with the bouncers. They threw her out. So it was also interesting she had waited three days to file a rape complaint since all traces of GHB are usually gone from the body in two days, and she damn well knew that. Jane Doe had a history of drug abuse, by the way, uh, and she knew the system. She knows how the system works. She knows how drug te testing works. Police drove her to the emergency room and administered a... a uh, a test that found no GHB in her system. The prosecution would later refuse to divulge any other substance that was found in her, including heroin and cocaine. Let me go over that again. The prosecution would later refuse to divulge any other substance that was found in her system, including heroin and cocaine. And they specifically asked, does she have heroin in it? Does she have blood, uh, cocaine in her blood? So, uh, we don't know. When a judge ordered the prosecutors to turn the test uh, results over to the defense. They said the police had lost them and probably uh, destroyed the file. Well, 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 she had also testified that on the night they were uh, at Luster's home, she asked Luster what was the drink he was offering her and that he replied, liquid X, meaning she knew full well that she was taking what she accepted as a drink. She had taken it many times before. But again, that wasn't the evidence the police needed to make an arrest. So to get the right kind of evidence with the detectives coaching her into using specific language that would get Luster to incriminate himself, Jane Doe, 
one, called Luster with the cops listening in on the call and asked if uh, he, she, he had given her Liquid X. Yes, a seemingly confused Luster responds. You can hear it in his voice. Don't I always? The only thing the conversation brought out was that Luster and the woman took GHB together and had sex on a fairly regular basis. As far as the cops were concerned, it was enough for probable cause arrest. It was a weak bit of evidence at best, but Luster's status as a wealthy member of the Factor family, Factor Cosmetics uh, was started by Max Factor back in the 20s. He, uh, that made him a trophy arrest for this career-climbing Ventura County Authority. Um, I guess this is a good time to tell. I wrote a book about a gangster named Roger Tui. who's not related to me. Roger Tui uh, was jailed for 25 years, 28 years, uh, because Factor, John Factor, Max Factor's brother, kidnapped himself to avoid extradition to England, where he was wanted for swindling thousands of people out of money. And uh, Tui did all that time in jail, and he was murdered when he got out. So that's how this came to my attention. The Factor family name came to my attention. Anyway, I should have told you that at the top. The next morning, when Luster pulled out of his driveway, he entered Route 1. He's surrounded by eight count them, eight squad cars and 12 geez, heavily armed cops. Their guns are drawn on this guy. He said they were yelling and screaming at me and threatening to shoot me, he said to his lawyer. He was thrown onto the roadway, face first, handcuffed, behind his back, arrested for using narcotic date to rape Jane Doe 1. This is a, Jane Doe is a girl who had sex with three guys and then did it again the next morning when she wasn't loaded. I'm going to have a sip of coffee. I don't usually drink on these things, but this is a long piece. Luster uh, foolishly agreed to be interviewed by the police. <sighs> don't ever do that if you get arrested. For three hours, without an attorney present, for God's sakes. And he effectively, he gave the cops the transcripts uh, that would prove damning during his trial. Uh, we did have consensual sex, completely sensual, Luster said. I don't know where she gets assault. There was no struggling, no saying no, 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 nothing like that. She totally dug it. There was no negativity at all. She was loving it. At the same time that he was talking to the detectives, a second squad of 10 cops, armed with a search warrant, raided Luster's home. They told the press on camera that they found vials of clear liquid thought to be GHB, cocaine, 13 illegal firearms, including an AK-47 assault rifle, the cops said that there was a collection of small screw-top bottles bearing hand-lettered labels like knockout drops, frigid fluid, lollipop juice. Later, in a less dramatic way, the cops announced that the contents of the vials were tested and confirmed to only have water because they were props in Luster's semi-porn movie production. Let me tell you again, by the way, this is a guy who barely got out of high school, um, was raised by a single mother. He's on a trust fund that was about $40,000 a year, and his life was spent uh, uh, surfing, which is why he moved to the beach. So, uh, I mean, they're, so they're building this case that this guy is Jack the Rapist. Uh, you know. uh, anyway, the cops also collected and impounded new pictures girly magazines, a variety of porn films, and sex toys, which the judge in the case would later allow as evidence that could be shown to the jury on the argument that the pro from the prosecution that sex toys and so on were a regular possession of any rapist. Um, if that were the case, half of America would be in jail. Why the judge, Ken Riley, allowed it is unknown, but he did. Um, when the smoke cleared, no GHB was found in in the Luster house, or no toxicology test uh, proved any. The illegal firearms turned out to be a near priceless and very legal gun collection. The firing pins removed from the weapons three decades before. The supposed AK-47 assault rifle simply disappeared from the police report altogether, and the charges were dropped. The alleged vial of cocaine also disappeared from the arrest report, and those charges were dropped as well. And yet the media, which ran with the dope and gun story, never went back and said, oh, by the way, the cops made it all up. Never. They just left it there. This guy had assault rifles and 
of an armory in his house and loads of dope, and that's where they left it. I mean, really, the responsible thing to do is go back and say, look, the cops uh, sat down, got together, lied about all this, and we reported it, and that was dumb, and now we're sorry, and he didn't have any of that stuff in his house. Bear in mind, the people listening to this local news show about this supposed madman rapist with the armory are going to try him later on in court. Is his neighbors listening to this. Bear that in mind. So what the cops did find in Lester's house was a catch of photo uh, photographs and home videos that showed Lester having sex with unconscious women, including a woman that Jane Doe One later identified as Lester's living girlfriend. So although the police had a warrant to search Lester's house, the details of what they could search for, it was limited. And it didn't include taking... Uh, and watching his videotapes on the warrant request because the initial informant, Jane Doe One, claimed that she did not know that she had been taped. Later, Jane Doe Two and Three said the same thing. However, most of the tapes the cops found in Jane, uh, have Jane Doe looking into the camera, all the Jane Doe's, One, Two, and Three, are looking into the camera asking, how's my hair? Am I moving the right way? Is this how you want me? Is the makeup holding up? under the lights, uh, or with Luster scolding one of the women uh, for looking too awake. The scenes, however, were excluded as evidence. Before the case went to court, the prosecution simply spliced those segments out of the videos, if you can believe this, before they were shown to the jury. So what the jury saw was basically a guy having sex with a woman who didn't know she was having sex, not the part where her looking at him while he's moving the camera around and pretending she's going back to sleep. The judge not only suppressed the tape, he refused to allow the jury to view it or to be told of its existence. The prosecutor admitted to the judge that Jane Doe, Jane Doe too had committed perjury when she denied allowing him to tape the encounters, but the judge took no action against her and the judge refused to allow the defense to cross-examine her on the issue uh, for another two weeks. They did eventually get to question her on that, but how it works in a trial is uh, you have to work on the moment on a criminal trial. You can't let it slip for two weeks because then you've got to remind the jury why it was important in the first place. But, you know, two weeks is a long time for sitting in your can. You ever work on a jury? You just sit there? I mean, you numb up after a while. Two weeks into this, they don't know nothing about nothing, but it was pretty clever what they did. Um, uh, in all, the government aid edited 16 hours of video down to 60 minutes. Let me do that again for you. In all, the government edited, edited 16 hours of video down to one hour. No chain of custody was preserved for the defense to follow uh, or to access the originals. The judge never saw the original videos because he was told they don't exist. This 60-minute tape we have here, this is the original. That's the lie he was told. And the jury would convict Luster based on only the facts that the prosecution wanted them to see. And they got away with it. This guy's still in jail. And they just denied him parole again. When asked about the tape, which was uh, made on the first night she met Luster in a bar, Jane Doe too, who was under the impression that Luster's net worth was $80 million dollars, said, and it wasn't, it was $40,000 a year, said she, if you have a trust fund, you can't get at it. I mean, it's, there are lawyers taking care of this sort of thing. She said she had been aware uh, of the sex and the taping and that she was positive. Uh, they were made on the couple's first date. Time data materials proved they weren't. She was lying. According to Lust, the tape, and there were 17 total with three different women, not hundreds, as they reported in the press, were made with her consent and knowledge. She enthusiastically, one of his lawyer, Lester's lawyers said, she enthusiastically par uh, participated in fetish films with the defendant. And that's the truth. Let other tapes show Jane Doe, too, being filmed during sex with Lester, where she speaks directly to the camera, by the way. Uh, th that was ruled inadmissible in court, as there were several tapes showing Jane Doe 1 and 2 discussing li liquid ecstasy before taking it. She admitted that during those several months with Lester that she willingly took GHB with him on a regular basis and allowed him to take tape the sex games. She later denied having made that statement. <laughs> anyway, 
The living girlfriend, we'll call her Jane Doe number two, lived with uh, Andrew Luster for four and a half months before they broke up. It didn't go. They were angry and they broke up. Uh, as for the tapes in question, Jane Doe two, the living girlfriend, continued to live with Luster a year after the tapes were made. During that time, she was regularly involved in Deep Sips Productions, the soft porn company he had. And um, she kept books for the company, performed clerical tasks for the company, replied on the mail for the company. She would later deny all of that until she was forced to acknowledge her involvement in court. The bad split between them, Jane Doe no, no, number two and Andrew Luster, uh, came about after she had an affair with and later married Luster's neighbor. Several people in the small community reported seeing her slip into the neighbor's house whenever Luster left for L.A. to spend a weekend with his uh, children. He was divorced and had children by another marriage. On several of those nights, drunken, violent fights were had that caused the police to show up. When the attorneys tried to get the records of the police showing up at, these, at the neighbor's house where she was drunk and fighting, uh, the cops said they couldn't locate the records. According to those familiar with her, Jane Doe, too, uh, had left her prior relationship with a carpenter named Ed in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, when Ed discovered she was moonlighting in a strip joint as an exotic dancer and didn't tell him. There was an argument, and she fled to uh, his sister's house outside Santa Barbara, where she met Luster in a bar. She moved in with him on that night that they met, took GHB and filmed their first sexual encounter. She sounds like a doll, doesn't she? During that time, she lived with Luster. He loaned, uh, she was an aspiring actress. He loaned her $4,000 to have her uh, teeth fixed. Uh, and but then he was forced to sue her uh, to get the money back because she never made a payment after she moved out. So basically she got her teeth fixed and left. According to witnesses, the suit infuriated her and she made several threats to, quote, get even, in her words, with Luster. She also told two Ventura County policewomen that, Lust, that the Luster case, quote, will be my payday for sure. A third person, Jane Doe III, a heavyset woman, was traced after police recognized a distinctive tattoo on her body. Evidently, she was a minor uh, criminal already. She was known to the cops. Again, which is how they knew the tattoo. Again, like Jane Doe 1, Jane Doe 2, Jane Doe 3, knew Luster, was sexually involved with him for several years, borrowed money from him, and occasionally lived at her house when she had a fight with her regular boyfriend. Um, I don't being mean, but you see a pattern here. I mean, women use this guy, Luster. You know, he's, um, and he uses them, I suppose, to an extent, but there's a pattern. where, uh, Like the others, she had sex with Luster on videotape, with uh, knowledge and consent, uh, like the others. Uh, it, uh, she is seemingly unconscious in these things. The other problem was that she was 17. That's the big thing. When the video was made, she had no memory of the tape being made, she said. Um, police, now claiming Luster was a member of, the, of an internet group called The Bachelors, uh, which has never been proven to actually exist. These were members that traded details of their sexual exploits, charged Luster with sexual assault, drug, illegal weapons charges, kidnapping with intent to commit rape and illegal videotaping. In all, he was uh, charged with 21 counts and bail was set at $1 million. It was later raised to $10 million when the prosecutors fi filed 19 more charges against him. Andrew Luster was released on bail of $1 million, lowered from $10 million. He was able to pay uh, $300,000 from of his bail, a six-year advance, uh, by taking a six-year advance on his trust fund, borrowed from his family uh, that her his mother guaranteed to pay the family back. So uh, he was confined to his home, uh, monitored electronically, subject to searches, random drug tests without reasonable cause, barred from contacting alleged victims and prohibited from using drugs or alcohol. It was a hard fall for Luster, uh, who wasn't used to hard falls. Andrew Luster was born in L.A. in 1963, child of a broken home. His father was a prominent and successful psychiatrist 
who died of lung cancer in 1972. His mother, Elizabeth Luster, uh, was an adopted child of the of the Max Factor family. So um, this is something I was told by a film producer. Uh, I, I don't know if it's true. I, I wouldn't. But apparently, she, the mother, had been raped, uh, and that's who the son was. He was a product of rape. Uh, again, a producer told me that, and the, the psychiatrist is the one who, his father is the one who did the raping, but I, I don't know that to be true. Andrew and his, uh, the producer of the film told me that. Andrew and a younger sister were raised by their mother and a nanny in uh, Las Vegas and in Malibu in a $4.7 million home on a street where his direct neighbors were Barbara Streisand, Cher, and Larry Hagman, who was on Dallas. Remember that? Aside from that, he had an average childhood. I mean, he was in Cub Scouts, Little League. Uh, he was a catcher, karate camp. Uh, he wasn't a problem child. He got along well with everybody else. He went to public schools until 10th grade, and then he transferred to a relatively new Windward School in West Las Vegas. It's a good school, but it's hardly a bastion of L.A. privilege. There are far, far better schools. Again, it's not a bad school, but it's not what you think of an elite place. Um, he's a natural athlete. He skied, snowboard. He was an accomplished rock climber, a diver, uh, and of course surfing was his big thing. That was his passion. His other passion was ocean fishing. Uh, a better than average student, he graduated at school at 17, moved into his own apartment at 18, enrolled in Santa Barbara Community College, City College. Uh, like thousands of other kids in search for himself, he took courses uh, part-time for four years. I can tell you about that. Without earning a degree, it was about that time that he had a long-term uh, girlfriend. She stayed with him for four years. In 1981, Andrew turned 18. His mother uh, bought him this modestly priced, it was $170,000 beach house on Ocean Drive, as I told you, in Muscle Shoals, north of Malibu, way up the coast. I didn't think I would ever get there. Uh, 900 square feet, uh, the house is 900 square feet, um, situated less than 100 feet from Highway 101. It's loud. There's a flat-top, one-story bungalow. It has two bedrooms. Uh, so, you know, it was, to me, about the size of a double-wide trailer. It didn't look too much different from a double-wide trailer. At the time he was arrested, he was was really in need of extensive repairs. Uh, he was several years behind on the property taxes. It's hardly this ostentatious bachelor pad that if you look back on the printed reports he was living in. Another long-term relationship in the 1980s produced two children, a boy born in 1991, a girl born in 1994. Luster's family provided well enough for them, and Andrew himself was in regular contact with the children and was around them quite a bit. There were occasional fishing and surfing expeditions around the globe when money allowed it. And during his 19 years at the beach house, it was a, it's a rock beach, by the way. It's not, you know, soft sand, beautiful. It was rock and uh, big jagged rocks sticking out. And he was accredited with uh, saving at least five people from drowning, accredited by the county. Uh, he was known for his rescue work, uh, and he worked with abandoned and neglected animals for the county as well. Luster started a surfboard company that occasionally sold a few boards, uh, formed a film production company, I told you, that made this low-grade films, dabbled in real estate, he played the stock market as a day trader when he had the money, he had a marketing company that sold beachwear, watches, wallets, purses, and that sort of thing. But otherwise, he never held on a job. Primarily, he surfed. He hung out at Recon Point, a California surfing mecca, uh, just a few miles from his home. He drank, and he cruised the bars near Santa Barbara. He lived off the proceeds of his fund allowance, which was 55000 I'm sorry, not 40000 55000 a year. He is not, no matter how many times the press reported it, a direct heir to Max Factor fortune. His grandmother, Frida Factor, set up a $3.1 million trust in Drew's name, Andrew Luster's name, and he had managed to borrow heavily against that. In fact, at the time of his arrest, Luster's trust fund was $204,000 in debt. A significant part of his allowance went to child support for his two kids and his common-law wife. The two separated, but Luster was deeply involved with his kids, who lived in, uh, in a villa in a pricey 
place called Pas Pacific Palisades. So, uh, at best, though, Vanjura County had a weak case. So why go on with the prosecution? Why not drop the case? Because that isn't the way things are done in Ventura County. In October 2011, Catherine Volker, the supervisor of the narcotics and misdemeanor cases, outlined a trial competition uh, to her staff and in an email that listed rewards the winner could receive, which including assisting in a narcotics trial uh, and going on a, a, a ride-along in a drug raid. She said that uh, the goal was to try as many cases as possible during the competition that was to run from October 11th to December 13th. Guess when he was arrested. The email started stated that her attorneys were to proceed to the trial even if their own witnesses did not testify favorably to the position. Or, in other words, go to trial in absence of proof beyond any reasonable doubt. Isn't that wonderful? The competition was nothing new. For years, the prosecutors had tried the most uh, felony and misdemeanor cases every quarter and were recognized with photos and plaques. The competition practice had been encouraged from the top of the DA's office down to the supervisors. Two former prosecutors from the DA office came forward and said that the trial competitions were management-driven to pump up the office's statistics. One of them, David Lear, who worked at the DA's office for 13 years, said that one of the reasons for pumping up the statistics so well is that it helps uh, the voting public that they come across as looking to be tough on crime and all that sort of silliness. Again, on December 16, 2002, it was a respected, well-seasoned judge. There was a jury of seven women, five men. But for all the money the Luster family had paid out, their, their defense team was laughably, comically incompetent. Uh, they never provided Luster with any advice on how to conduct themselves in public, and it was very much a public trial. The media was very much interested in this because it had the word sex in it and rape and all, and they loved that sort of thing. And so they were out in force, but no one ever said, look, dress this way, pick your head up, smile, nothing. Um, as a result, he came across very poorly in court, and he was just naturally shy, and they'd scream out questions to him, and he just didn't know how to handle I don't think anybody would know how to handle that. Uh, and he, So he came across because I think the media wanted him to come across as a spoiled, arrogant, rich kid. Unfortunately, that demeanor was mixed with this, this poisonous, that, it was a made-up demeanor, by the way. Uh, that, I mean, this guy could care less about the trappings of being rich. He, he was a surfer. That's what he wanted to live on the beach and surf. He cared about his kids. And he had some quirks, admittedly. But um, So there was that. And the demeanor that they created in this poisonous atmosphere, which was really created by the prosecutors, uh, they added air to it, uh, carried out by the media. Uh, Lester, as I say, becomes this arrogant, ne'er-do-well, self-possessed kid with a perpetual sneer uh, because he just didn't smile. No one said, smile for the camera. Uh, he was nervous. And he carried himself the way it was reported with a contemptuous comportment, as one paper said, uh, as he entered and exited the courtroom. Uh, but again, the reality was nothing close to that was going on. It was what was manufactured for him, about him. A few days before Christmas, the judge declares a two weeks holiday recess. It's then that Andrew Luster goes on the run and he seals his fate. But why did he run? I mean, at best, the state had a weak case, largely because the, the witness's integrity was so bad. It was really badly compromised. From the dis defense perspective and the evidence they presented, the Jane Doe's 1 and 2 had willingly ingested GHB, knowing they would likely pass out with a high degree of certainty that they would be engaging in sexual acts as they had in the past. Jane Doe, too, after all, admitted she was had willingly ingested the GHB while living with Luster, allowed herself to be filmed while engaging in sex on GHB or otherwise. That alone would have caused the jury to conclude that there was a reasonable doubt in the case. You just need a little bit of reasonable doubt. You don't have to have pages of it, just one thing. The case could also have been dismissed 
technically because Luster had been charged with kidnapping in the original arrest warrant, but he was being tried for rape. And then there's the illegal police procedure, the seizures of, of the sex videos. They had no right to get that. Conflicts with the judge over admissibility of evidence would have been overturned by another court. Concerns over whether the police and the prosecutors had primed and prompted the Jane Doe's to help them shape their case, fed them what to say, in other words. Jane Doe 1 would also tell the court that the incident uh, was her first date, was on her first date with Luster, when dozens and dozens of witnesses would conflict that evidence. She was lying. Further, the defense had proof that the district attorney refused to test DNA evidence, and he didn't look uh, at nightclub videos of surveillance showing Jane Doe number one and Luster together. So why? Why run if that's the case? Well, the answer is found in, unfortunately, um, his legal team, uh, Jay, uh, the attorney, California attorney, Jay Litterman, Letterman, I should say, L-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N, was one of the later lawyers who would tell the appeals court, quote, if O.J. Simpson had the dream team of criminal defense lawyers, then Andrew Luster most certainly had the nightmare team, end quote. From the onset of the case, uh, he was doomed by his defense team. The first team of lawyers, a guy, Joel Isaacson and another guy, James Blatt, were dismissed for giving conflicting evidence. I don't blame him. Blatt encouraged Luster to plead guilty, serve 8 to 12 years, he said, you'll be fine. Isaac wanted him to fight the, Isaac Sun rather wanted him to fight the charges. According to Luster, neither one recommended, nor did they tell him to take the plea agreement which had been offered by the state. So you've got a guy who's, as I said, basically a surfer, and he's now got to make his own legal decision with our, you know, shadow away from life and death. You know, 8 to 12 years in prison for a guy like him, or for anybody, I guess, suppose, but this is not a hardened criminal. Uh, it got worse when Blatt and Isaacson were replaced by uh, the Luster family with this guy who's a piece of work, Richard Sherman. He cost several hundred thousand dollars to take the case. Sherman moved to L.A. from Chicago with his parents when he was 13. He served in the Korean War. He held uh, the title of Armed Forces Heavyweight Champion for two years in the 50s. He started to practice law in the late 1950s, and his record was questionable. He represented John Batts Battaglia in court. Battaglia was a, an L.A. gangster, he was a big-time gangster and a big-dollar dope pusher. Um, he also ran a con. Um, it, it was a simple con. Sherman, working through a street operative named Mr. K, who was a private detective, would figure out which of his clients were flush with cash because his, his bread and butter were, were dope dealers because he was good at getting them off on, on the lack of evidence. So the private eye, Mr. K, would arrange for death threats to be made to the clients and to the clients' families and to the people the client knew. Then according to this guy, Jan Tuck, who was a private eye in L.A., quote, when you're a drug dealer and somebody makes a threat against your life, you don't call the local gendarmes. You call your criminal defense lawyer. So Sherman would listen uh, to their frantic calls and play his part in this play of drama imitating life, he'd tell them, that sounds really serious. I want you to meet Mr. K. He'll get uh, you, uh, and he'll find out what's going on. He's really connected. So, end quote. Other times, Sherman called the client and told him that the threats had come into his office, that he was being threatened, Sherman was being threatened, uh, since he was known to be the dealer's attorney on record, and... Then he'd start to threaten. He'd have his people start to threaten the client as well, just to make sure it really hit home. This farce went on for a couple more weeks until the client was convinced that his life could be saved with a cash payment of several hundred thousand dollars cash. Uh, the dope dealer, they had plenty of cash laying around, made the payment through Mr. K, the private detective who was working for Sherman, and the threat stopped. Sherman started to run a scam on Luster, Luster at the very start of the case, telling Andrew that he didn't have a chance in hell in the Ventura uh, County justice system. He was, he said, a Beverly Hills Jew, uh, after all, as, as far as the people in Ventura County would see it, 
he said, according to, um, Sherman said, according to Luster and others, he had heard that there was a conspiracy of the district attorney, the sheriff, and the judiciary against him, against Luster, and that if he went to prison, he would, and all certainly, quote, would be killed or at the least crippled for life because rapists are so far down the in inmate's food chain. It's an attorney telling his client that. Luster believed it because uh, during his uh, during his time in jail, a sheriff's deputy threatened to push him downstairs, saying nobody would know what happened if he went down the stairs and broke his neck. Uh, the beating Luster was taking in the press was merciless, and it was taking its toll on him as well. The gamut of the stories ran along these lines. Uh, any Andy Luster in his own breed of, is his own breed of California reptile, and it, it got worse from there. So Sherman, the attorney, coaxes, he controls, he terrorizes Luster little by little into believing he had to escape the jurisdiction in order to survive. And he made Luster believe that there was no alternative to his advice, and his advice was to run. You see, they had signed over Luster's beach house to Sherman as, as a collateral for the house. If he ran, the collateral was what he could take the house. So at the same time, Herman is working on Andrew's mother, uh, telling this uh, she's something, 70-something uh, something years old. If you were my son, uh, if he were my son, I would tell him to leave, Sherman said. Sherman played on Lester's paranoia well enough so that when the judge started ruling against him in a series of motions and denied him the right to use uh, consent as a defense, Sherman said it was a horrible sign. It was a very bad sign of things to come. I felt the court was fixed, Luster said. I don't blame him. Andrew Luster wasn't the first client, client rather, that Sherman had run out on. In December of 1978, was a guy named Joe Samet was fired from his job cleaning American Airlines, airline jets, for American Airlines. He was accused of stealing 10 cans of soda from a Boeing 727 in L.A. airport. What he had actually done is he had taken these 10 cans of soda and move them to the front of the plane where they belong, but someone assumed, well, you're stealing those. Uh, the union refused to help him. There was no theft, and there was certainly no theft that was provable. He was, as I said, carrying the soda to be put where they belong. The sodas never left the plane. Samut made nine bucks an hour. He hired Richard Sherman, you can imagine, to defend him. Sherman wanted $2,500 as a retainer, to cover the cost of depositions and other expenses, blah, 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 before filing a suit against American Airlines. None of that would have been needed had Sherman simply read a publicly available airlines record, which read that under company policies, workers could only be accused of theft from a plane if they removed the property from the plane. It was right in the guy's contract. Sherman took no depositions, subpoena no records. When Samus asked, you know, what's going on, uh, Sherman said, ah, no, don't worry, things are, quote, things are going beautifully. But he never actually did anything. So this thing dragged on uh, for years. And Sherman agreed to, dis without talking to the client, to Samut, to dismiss the case against the union without giving any reason or, as I said, without consent. So they were suing the union as well for not helping this guy. American Air uh, Airlines uh, warned Sherman that it, too, would seek a dismissal, but Sherman ignored the warning and, again, never told his client about it. When Summit sh sued Sherman, Sherman agreed that he dropped some of his lit litigation because the case was not winnable and that he believed that the firing was justified under airline regulations. Clearly, again, the regulations are, leave the plane, you're stealing it. In 1987, the L.A. Superior Court awarded him uh, eight hundred thousand dollars in dam Mr. Smoot, eight hundred grand in damages against Sherman, uh, the lawyer he had hired to help him. Sherman's had his motives to get Andrew Luster to run or to see him land in prison, but his first motive was to string the Luster family along, because he assumed they were endlessly rich and to siphon off as much money as he could from the family. Uh, when the prosecution offered up a sentence of less than twelve years. The offer wasn't forwarded to the Luster family, who ended up with a hundred. Luster would end up with a hundred and twenty-four year sentence. So the state was offering twelve. Probably could argue that down to six, and instead he's sentenced to one hundred twenty-four years because this clown 
didn't feel like he should tell uh, his client what's going on. To make sure another offer wasn't given, Sherman created a, quote, toxic atmosphere during court proceedings. When the Lusters, uh, what the Lusters didn't know was that Sherman was in bankruptcy proceedings after he and others sold oil wells that either didn't exist or oversold them to investors. The lawsuits against him started to pile up, and Sherman, who took 850000 in advance for uh, representing the investors without telling them it was his company they were investing in, started to run a Ponzi scheme to pay some of the investors back and to make payments on his house, which was in danger in Beverly Hills, which was in danger of being foreclosed upon. The SEC was investigating the case. Justice Department was drawing up an indictment uh, based on the SEC case. So he's desperate for cash. He was carrying 600 grand in debt and other loans to siphon the oil well stuff going on. Sherman pressured Luster into signing a quick claim deed, a quick claim deed, I'm sorry, I meant quick claim deed, uh, on his Muscle Shoals beach house uh, to investors who were suing, suing Sherman over the lost funds. Finally, Luster agreed to flee and Sherman arranged for his private investigator, Patrick Campbell, to handle it. At the meeting at Sherman's house, uh, home, Sherman greeted him at the door, showed him in, showed Luster, uh, in, and introduced him to a man named Patrick Campbell. The attorney then left the room while Campbell strip searched Andrew Luster. Campbell was apparently searching for sound recordings or transmitting devices. Campbell then instructed Andrew Luster to give him 80 grand cash and then. Campbell would take him out of the jurisdiction and ensure his safety after that. So Sherman convinced Luster to give Campbell 80 grand to bring him across the Mexican border because in the event the escape went wrong, Luster had the cash with him. Authorities would impound the money and eventually steal it. That's what he was told. Sherman later told Luster that once he was safely in Mexico, he would get the 80 grand back. Of course, he didn't. You know, the other thing to remember here is that Luster wasn't convicted yet. He could have crossed the border. I mean, nobody knew who the hell he was. or He could have done it on his own, but they had put him in such a state of paranoia. He assumed everyone at the border was just waiting for him to try to cross. And they, they weren't. They didn't know who it, what he was or who he was. On, the, on his last day in California, this is January 3rd, Luster, probably with Campbell's help, slipped his uh, court-ordered ankle bracelet off. I don't know how he did that. And went south in Mexico. I imagine the private eye helped him do that. When the trial resumed several days later, the sheriff's office announced that Luster had skipped bail and disappeared. The judge ordered a 40, 430,000 uh, bail that he had paid on a money order to be given to the three victims, victims to compensate for their lost wages, attorney's fees, uh, counseling, and medical expenses. Trial in absentia is a trial when you're not there and they're having a trial about you. They're rare in California, but that's what they gave Andrew Luster. So, desperate to do anything to save his case, Roger Diamond, who was another Luster lawyer, said that his client uh, was like a character in the TV series, the film The Fugitive, innocent and wrongly accused. Uh, he seeks out to get justice. The press called it a Hollywood defense. Everyone else just laughed at this guy. He could have come up with a better answer. So, in other words, what he's saying is Andrew took off to prove he's innocent. And, uh, I don't know what the hell he was saying. In summation of his case, the prosecutor stood and said, innocent men don't run. Boom. Jury agreed. They declared Luster guilty of 86 of 87 charges against him. They deadlocked on on, um, on a single insignificant poisoning charge. Luster was convicted of 20 counts of drug-induced rape, 17 counts of rape of an unconscious victim, and multiple counts of sodomy or a copulation by use of drug. The judge sentenced him to 124 years in prison and ordered him to pay $1 million in restitution, uh, one of the largest monetary vic uh, verdicts ever in Ventura County, California. So, in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, it's a popular tourist town. It's filled with Americans. Andrew Luster, he, who spoke fairly good Spanish, uh, had picked up the life where he left off in Muscle Shoals before he, everything he knew blew up. He, sur he surfed down there where he was living. 
He fished. He lived in a $35 a night motel next door, by the way, to the Federal Justice Department local office. He seemed Mexican, hotel manager Oscar Lopez said. He spoke Spanish very well. Dozens of other witnesses had seen him in town and reported that he wasn't trying to hide. A Seattle area couple recognized him from the news and snapped his picture. When they returned uh, to the States, they called the FBI. The Seattle office sent uh, word to one of his agents in Guadalajara, Mexico. Eight days later, after they received the tip, the Bureau's Guadalajara-based agent showed up in Puerto Vallada looking for Andrew Luster. A second call the couple made was to the bounty hunter, Dwayne Dog Chapman, whose efforts to find Luster have been well publicized by Dwayne Dog Chapman. In fact, within days of Luster taking flight, Chapman vowed before the cameras an illegal sort of shotgun strapped around his chest to get Luster and bring him back to justice. Fee fi fo fum, look out Luster because here I come, he said. He became a TV hero overnight. We're talking about the dog. Uh, but then again, that was the entire point. That was what he was trying to do. At the time, Chapman uh, was secretly pitching the idea of a reality TV show with him as a star called Dog, Bounty Hunter, uh, whose theme would be born on a mountain, raised in a cave, arresting fugitives is all I crave. Oh, Lord. Chapman had already pitched a book concept on his search and pending capture of Luster, if you could believe this. Chapman who's an ex-con, he's a Bible-quoting, born-again Christian who was once a member of the Texas chapter of the Devil's Disciples, a motorcycle gang. Gee, they were known mostly as wholesalers of methamphetamine uh, across the lower southwestern states. His arrest included armed robbery and 17 other felony counts and one conviction for murder and a dope deal gone wrong. He served less than 18 months for the crime. He claims to have hunted down 6,000 fugitives, or roughly one every weekday since 1978 until that time, 2002. Many doubt that number, and many more doubt that he was even ever a bounty hunter. What is certain is that Chapman was a Hawaiian-based bail bondsman who hired bounty hunters before the Luster case landed in his lap. So that explains the 6,000 cases, maybe. The role he acts out, one report noted, one reporter noted, is a low-life Superman, James Bondsman. <laughs> he is a catnip for television producers of a certain ilk who, glistening from flop sweat, fighting their equally shiny competitors, can speed dial him blindfolded. Bob Kimsey, a Bond uh, enforcement agent based in Vegas, said, Chapman is one of the most unprofessional bounty hunters we've ever seen. We wish he would go away. Chapman leaped uh, to the lead and formed a group that included uh, his bounty hunter son, uh, a television producer from for the show uh, America's Most Wanted, an actor to act if he needed you know, an extra hanging around, a uh, camera crew, and they traveled to Puerto Vallada within two hours of getting the lead from that couple that they could find Andrew down there, Andrew Luster down there. So... For the next several weeks, Chapman spread stories throughout the media that Luster was an international rapist. I, I don't know how he came to that conclusion. And was traveling uh, with five bodyguards, and that Luster had phoned and emailed Chapman with taunts. I, I sincerely doubt that, I don't mean anything by that, I don't think Luster even knew how to use email. Actually, Luster, uh, he didn't own a TV, and it, Turned out he had never heard of Chapman. So on June the 18th, 2003, Chapman kidnaps Luster as he ate a chicken taco from a street vendor. Chapman would later say that he took Luster down in a disco where he saw Luster, quote, rubbing his hands gleefully on the prowl of his next victim. His best story was that after he captured Luster, Chapman said he searched Luster's, quote, spacious and expensive hotel room and found, quote, a rape kit, complete with GHB, plastic handcuffs, etc. Of course, the reality was that Chapman was never in Luster's teeny little rented room uh, before or after the capture. There's no such thing as a rape kit. He didn't have that on him. He'd be a moron. Several heavily armed uh, men, young men, 
grab Lester, who's slightly drunk and is easily knocked down onto the street, and they hog tie him and they drag and put him in their car. Uh, according to witnesses, a police spokesman said they used the spray with an irritant, maybe tear gas, to subdue him. They handcuffed him. So Luster's hogtied, he's tossed in the back of their van. Chapman and friends, they head towards the border. But the local cops were responding to a kidnapping call, and they ran the van off the road, and they make him get out of the van, guns drawn. Uh, Luster yells in Mexican, which helps, but in Spanish, which helps, I need help because they're trying to harm me. For their part, the police decided, let's just lock these guys up, we'll put them in jail. They drove them to the next town, Las Juntas, and uh, remarkably, uh, they shoved Luster in the cell with Chapman. Uh, I think the cops just said, let the, let the courts figure this out. So in court, Chapman, a.k.a. the greatest bounty hunter in the world, according to him, too, uh, and he wouldn't lie, was told that he was to face kidnapping charges and that it carried a maximum, maximum sentence of four years uh, in a Mexican prison. That would be delightful. Since bounty hunting is considered uh, a, a kidnapping in Mexico, it's illegal. Uh, Mexican officials agreed th that the reasonable thing Chapman should have done was gone to the police, say, this is what we want, let them grab Luster and turn Luster over to him and get his reward. Uh, the government worker said, for one thing, it's illegal, bounty hunting, and for another, it's dangerous, which it is. Adding insult to injury, Luster was released first to the FBI, and then he sent back to the States. Chapman and his pals, they're kept in this 8 by 6 cement-floored cell. There's no toilet in it, no running water. It would take Chapman years to fight off the Mexican kidnapping charges. The Mexicans weren't going to let it go. When Luster returned to the States, his attorney was Stephen Yagman, who is now disbarred and convicted of federal felonies. The first thing Yagman did was to shut down Lester's cooperation with the government effort to find out who assisted him in his escape. Yagman had been referred to Lester by an inmate named Bill Wast, this guy, W-A-S-Z, Wast, who had leaped to fame by claiming that O.J. Simpson's lawyer had hired him to murder Nicole Simpson. Wass was a client of Richard Sherman. Remember Richard Sherman? He's the, the incredibly corrupt lawyer. Wass recorded a uh, record, rather, included stealing a truck and a front-end loader with some welding that, equipment. He took the front loader and he robbed a Safeway store in the wee hours of the morning, smashed in with the front loader, grabbed the safe, took it on the freeloader, uh, went home and broke into the safe. He got 63000 from that robbery. Later, he said he... Uh, he was a, uh, an enforcer for the mob in Vegas, which, knowing a little bit about that, I sincerely doubt happened. Um, he was arrested for stealing a pair of pants from a department store at gunpoint, uh, and that got him two years in prison. How would you like to go to prison, and the bad guys turn to you and say, what are you in for? And you say, well, I stole a pair of pants at gunpoint. That earned him two years in prison, and then he got another six months in Nevada uh, on an outstanding warrant he had there. When he was released, he returned to Virginia, where he was from, and according to him, he was a big-time drug dealer, and he had to go to California because people are after him, drug dealers. Uh, he said he was an enforcer and a gopher for a guy named Don Simpson, who was a film producer. He did Flashdance, Beverly Hills Cops, Top Gun, The Rock, etc. At the time, Wasp said he sold cocaine to celebrities, and that was how he met Robert Kardashian. You've heard of Kardashian's daughters, I'm sure. They're everywhere. Uh, Kardashian is a friend, was a friend, he's dead now, uh, and business partner and lawyer to O.J. Simpson. He claimed that in 1993, Kardashian called him just after Christmas, and he said, uh, he asked whether I would be interested, he said, in making some extra money. Kardashian said Nicole Simpson, O.J.'s wife, was unfaithful, and he wanted uh, Was to follow her around and get photographs of her and her lover, and he gave him a grand to continue with the surveillance. Uh, he did follow her for several weeks because police found that notebook where he kept his notes on the surveillance, and it contained uh, Nicole Simpson's private number, O.J. Simpson's private number, his girlfriend's private number, and Kardashian's private number. When Kardashian called Walsh to his, Walsh to his home in Encino later, he said, 
Bill, I want you to take her, Nicole, out. I want her to go away. We'll pay you fifteen grand in cash for doing it, according to Wash. Now that was said. I don't know what kind of a lawyer would say that out loud. Do you? Anyway, Kardashian told him exactly how he wanted it done. Uh, they would, he would steal a truck that belonged to O.J. Simpson's girlfriend. He'd kill Nicole with a twenty-five caliber, and then he'd drop the caliber in the truck, and the girl would be framed and so forth. Um, I don't know about that, but anyway, he said later he robbed Kardashian of cash, and then he got into a bunch of armed robbery things on his own, a couple of high-speed chases with the police, a shootout. The cops shot him in the leg, and they sent him to prison for 20 years for armed robbery. He served 10, and when he got out, he found his way to Elizabeth Lester. He had been in jail at the time with Andrew Lester. And so, anyway, remarkably, how this came about is remarkably, when Lester was arrested in Mexico, Sherman, that slimy lawyer, re remarkably, incredibly, contacts Lester's mother, and he says, look, again, he says, look, Give me 25000 and I'll represent him one more time. And for additional money, I'll ensure that he's safe in prison. In other words, he won't be slashed. But it was generally interpreted by many to be a threat. In other words, give me the 25000 we won't have him slashed in prison. She declined. Uh, but according to Wass, anyway, even though she declined, he acted as... Luster's bodyguard out of the goodness of his heart. Uh, when he got out of prison, he went to see the mother again, and he said, look, give me 150 grand, and I'm going to make sure it's going to be a payment for protecting your son. And she asked the logical question, well, why? Pr pr protect what? He's I, in prison. Yeah, but I, I have a lot of friends, and I can make sure that he's well taken care of in prison. And just pay she paid him incredibly. Uh, on March 16, 2005, Frank Longo, who was Watt's lawyer, and the building supervisor, they hadn't heard from him, so they walked in to his apartment in West Los Angeles, and he was dead. He'd been dead for three years. Not surprisingly, he died under suspicious circumstances, although the cause of death is technically toxic drug interaction. But you would think a guy who sold as much drugs and took as much drugs as he did would know better than to mix drugs, but who knows. Elizabeth Luster claimed after Wass died that Wass had embezzled the 150 grand from her. She hadn't given him the 150 grand. It really just seems like with the with the Lust family that you know, anybody can go in and steal from these people, the Luster family rather. It, it really does, doesn't it? I mean, one lawyer after the other is taking advantage of this woman and her money. They've driven her son broke. Anyway, supposedly she agreed to finance a documentary film Wast uh, was making about uh, from his unpublished book, We Only Kill Our Friends, about his role in the O.J. Simpson murder case. Law enforcement believes the entire film business that he fed her was nothing more than a cover for the Wast Sherman extortion of the Luster family. That went on for quite a while. So as soon as the Luster trial started, the Time Life Channel slapped together this really low, low-budget film about the affair and called it A Date with Darkness, The Trial and Capture of Andrew Luster. The film, it was a hit piece, to say, to be kind. Uh, the film wrapped in about a week, uh, just before Andrew was abducted in Mexico. But an additional four minutes was tacked on after, the, after Luster was exported from Mexico to the United States by the FBI. The producers moved the abduction to a beach scene <laughs> that was created in, on a Mexican beach setting because it just looked better to have him locked up uh, on a beach. Um, they filmed that in Victoria, British Columbia. In October 2003, Luster, he's now 39 years old, began serving his 124-year sentence at Wasco State Prison. A level one is a low security prison. Apparently four is the highest level. By then, the onslaught of civil lawsuits against him and the estates, the Luster estates, it began to pile up. And there was going to be a lot of them, and they would take years to slog through the court system. One of the more interesting suits came from Jane Doe, number two, Luster's ex-girlfriend, who claimed that she had lost a child she was carrying due to the stress of being a witness in a high-profile case. 
the case that she lied about. The suit went on, uh, went away when friends and neighbors of Lester's reported seeing Jane Doe, number two, snort cocaine with several friends during her pregnancy. But the women and the lawyers behind them were salivating for money. When CBS aired a special on, on the case, Jane Doe, number two, sued for millions, accusing Lester's mother, uh, the CBS network, and 25 others of wrongfully obtaining and televising a video uh, showing of her being sexually assaulted by Lester, even though the video didn't show the woman's face, nor did it identify the victim. So she's the one who came forward and said, that's me, in other words. Uh, Jane Doe 1 and Jane Doe 2, they wasted no time in the suing business either. Andrew Lester, they sued him in a civil suit, and they won. Uh, a court ordered Lester to pay a total of $39 million to the two women. Of that amount, Jane Doe 1, the most aggressive of the three, was to receive $19 million. However, winning judgments and getting cash out of a tangled Luster Factor family finance machine is two different things. To add to the mess, it's just not going to happen. If it doesn't happen, it won't happen at all uh, very quickly. To add to that mess, Luster was broke, and he declared bankruptcy in 2004. In 2008, the Luster family mounted another effort to have his case reviewed. This time, instead of slick and slippery, ethically challenged L.A. lawyers, uh, the family found Jay Letterman, who I've met and is a really great guy. He's a criminal defense lawyer, uh, a civil and personal rights advocate. Letterman, who lived and practiced in Ventura County, that's important. The other guys were a lot of people who came into Ventura County. He was interly, internationally recognized for his work in defending hacker activists, uh, accused of computer crimes, representing a large number of his hacker clients pro bono. Uh, he defended mer medical marijuana cases. He's one of the founding members of the whistleblower uh, defense. The lawyer filed a letterman, filed a, a uh, writ of habeas corpus, right of habeas corpus. That's a legal tool that's used by prisoners to try to win a court determination that they were imprisoned unlawfully and they should be released uh, and had their case heard a second time. The lawyer... Uh, argued that Luster was denied effective assistance of counsel and alleging that other legal and constitutional vi violations had happened in his case, to say the least, my gosh. In the writ, uh, he asked the court to reduce his sentence and consider setting aside his 2003 conviction. The court granted the writ and the hearing began in 2013. The crux of the argument was that Richard Sherman, who had died at this point, remember he's a scumbag lawyer, had denied effective counsel uh, to his client. Um, so in March of 2013, Ventura County Superior Court Judge Catherine Ann Stoltz set aside the 124-year prison sentence and granted Luster a new sentencing hearing because the judge in the initial, initial trial, quote, failed to state specific reasons for imposing full consecutive sentences as the law required. Judge Stoltz reduced Lester's sentence to 50 years in prison. Lester wept in the courtroom and told the judge that he was incredibly grateful, I'm sure he was, and promised that he would never recklessly uh, act recklessly and irresponsibly again. I did some really stupid things without thinking. It caused me so much damage to so many other people as well. There is more uh, to me than this salacious and lurid story that's been put out there, which is very true. He would be eligible for parole in 15 years. Well, that 15 years came and left this past December, and he was denied parole. And as far as I can see, they've, they've got an innocent man uh, in, in jail, and he should be released immediately. Even if, I don't know, let's say he were guilty of whatever, I think he certainly paid for that. He's lost everything he has. Uh, and he, was, he wasn't given justice. He was taken advantage of by slime bags who run in the halls of justice. It's terrible. Just a terrible thing.